we keep sure. going. Uh, go ahead, Judy. This is the uh, OGM weekly call for Thursday, October 19th, 2023. So since I'm one of the early people here, I'll, I'll start. Uh, we had a really interesting event on Tuesday night here. I'm coach co-president of the Minnesota chapter of ARCS Foundation, which is Achievement Rewards for College Scientists. We give $5,000 stipends to high talent grad students in STEM. And it's always a, a great event when we get to give out those awards and hear what these young, talented people are doing in their PhD dissertations. And this year we combined it with our Scientist of the Year event, um, which is a, a separate celebration usually, but it worked well to combine them. Uh, we honor someone at the University of Minnesota, usually, although occasionally it's from corporations nearby that are leaders in science in terms of being good scientists as, and well advanced in their career. And the, the honoree last night was Dr. David Bernor, who's the department head for BMBB at the University of Minnesota. He's also the head of the Metabolism Institute and his personal research is diabetes and metabolism. And he gave a really great talk. Uh, we will have a recording of it, we hope, <laughs> if the recording worked. Um, and I had no idea how important the thin layer of adipose tissue under our skin was hmm. until he explained it to us. It turns out primarily it's our first immune response because it protects us preliminarily from all of the things that happen. And it has a lot of capability. And of course, it gives us the fluidity of skin, which allows us to bend. <laughs> um, but in greater detail, he explained all of that. And it was just fascinating to understand. And He's well recognized. He's a fellow of AAAS. Um, he's had some awards and uh, he's, he's just really a talented speaker and a wonderful educator who's wrapping up a 50 year career at the university. Um, That's cool. Will be, what's he's the, what's his name again? David Bernlor, B E R N L O H R. And he's just, he was really impressive and kind of inspiring. And then you follow him by seven really talented grad students telling us what their research is about. It's always a high event. <laughs> so that was my news. For, that's my major news. Other than I came out to a car with a dead battery because I didn't inadvertently hit the hazard flashers. And that made it a very late night trying to get someone to provide assistance so that I could get back to my home. Thanks, Judy. We're off to our check-in start just because we started talking and Judy started checking in and we're like, let's go. Uh, so I think everybody here knows the rules of the road. I'm going to step back from the conversation, step in when you'd like to, take your time stepping in, etc., cetera, et cetera. Uh, I will tell people in the chat when they come in what's up. So um, onward from there. I'll check in. I'll start with the dead battery. Because I was sitting here waiting for this call to start, and then I realized that the clock on the wall has a dead battery, so it wasn't making it till 11 o'clock. <clears throat> I had a really, just my last half hour has been so interesting, because I came in, I got the mail, I got this Phi Beta Kappa publication that I haven't gotten in almost 40 years, and it led me to start thinking about school. And I was thinking about what was going to be my check-in today. And I started, anyway, in the middle, I get this ding on Facebook Messenger. And it's my college roommate that I haven't spoken to in 30 years. And she puts up there a list of, I had made her this list. There was this roommates game that was going to be like the newlywed game. And so I had put all the list of all the things I liked, my colors, my toothpaste. So she sent it to me. And, and it was literally at the moment that I was thinking about sitting next to her and a poem she gave me, the Ralph Waldo Emerson poem at graduation. And it was right in that exact moment that this ding came in with these 40 year old, with this 40 year old list and it was just interesting. And most of the things on the list haven't changed. I now take my coffee black, but it was, so that's really what's on most. I have other things, but maybe when we get into the conversation, we'll hit on that. But right now, this is the fun part. 
Thank you. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> So does this mean there's a topic that people want to talk about? Uh, not until we've completed the check-in round. And then you know, I'm asking if the reason nobody's jumping in, I'm, oh. I'm just putting it out there. There's a reason behind the silence. So I was um, comforted about the silence a couple calls ago, a couple check-in calls ago because I was getting a little bit nervous that we weren't sort of jumping in. And I am now treating these calls more like Quaker meeting, which is uh, basically silent meeting. And we'll jump in when we jump in and that's groovy. And for the people listening in later on recordings, I'll treat this more like a like a Quaker meeting and you can read up on that. I'll, I'll put a post in the in the chat about what Quaker meeting is like, but but I'm, I'm heading that way and, and I'm much more comfortable with it that way. If anybody's really uncomfortable, uh, let me know. And if what Stacy just asked is true, uh, say so in the chat and maybe we direct ourselves directly into a conversation about the Hamas situation or about AI and Andres and uh, Mark Andreessen's crazy ass uh, techno optimist uh, screed and whatever. There's, there's plenty of interesting things to be you know, concerned about these days. But I'll go back into silence and uh, let the let the call roll. So um, I wonder what a Quaker meeting would be like if there was chat in the background. Uh, I find myself constitutionally incapable of using chat. Uh, the reason is simple. If I'm listening to what people are saying, there are several levels of listening. There is what's being actually said and then what gets stirred up in me in reaction to what's being said. And if I go to chat, I'm going to cut off my own subterranean flow of thoughts. And I assume that that's true for other people too. The result being is we look like we're looking, listening to each other, but we're really not. I mean, come on. Uh, chat just is a disruptor of those deeper flow. I'll go next, um, and I'll start with that. I, I, I love chat. I love the multi-dimensional conversation that it enables. I love the many layers, Doug, that you just described, but it is not Quaker meeting, and it is not fully listening to each other. Um, and doing that is really rare in modern times. Um, um, I have the experience, I suspect that many of you do, of listening to somebody through the filters of what I'm already thinking, what my assessments are, what they're saying, what I want to say next, et cetera, which is not the same as listening. Uh, and it's uh, maybe it's a lost art. Maybe it's an artifact of modern times. I have deep respect and admiration for Quaker meeting and Jerry, what you're trying to bring to us here. And... Um, you know, and whatever the discomfort of it, um, I welcome it. And I'm guilty of chatting during stuff also, which I'm not going to do now. Uh, but Doug, thank you very much for that. I, um, you know, sort, sort of an indicator of how 
unfamiliar we are with this. And Stacy, this is not at all a criticism, but your discomfort with the silence is just. You know, I was, I wasn't uncomfortable at all. Okay. I was, I was asserting my agency to recognize something. I actually thought one of the two Dougs wanted or or were c contemplating jumping in. Not uh -huh. uncomfortable at all. Okay. A... Okay. Okay. Well, let me let me say it a different way. I was uh, I was fascinated by the 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 break in the silence for a meta comment about the silence as opposed to the silence just continuing. So you know, anyway, yeah. there you go. And just to add to that, I yeah. would have liked permission to. I mean, actually, I I would have liked to have add to it, but because I knew there's a rule that everybody has to check in, I didn't. So I was wondering if you know. I, I like a more natural flow of a conversation where if you feel moved to speak, regardless of anything, if the energy is right, you can mm -hmm. speak. So the way you jumped in after Doug, or I tried to start with the battery after Judy. Good enough. Um, so my check-in is, is two parts. Um, um, one is that I've been in a state which a friend diagnosed as PTSD for the last about 10 or 11 days um, in, in deep shock and anguish and anxiety. Um, at, you obviously know what I'm talking about, the situation in the Middle East. I found for a couple of days I couldn't speak about it much and, and didn't post about it much. Uh, and then did and was really surprised that uh, uh, no responses, no comments, no nothing on any of my posts, which is really unusual. Um, and then um, Wednesday, maybe last Wednesday, maybe last Thursday, I forget when, um, I posted something uh, carefully, gently provocative. Um, asked a question and um, have had a, a more engaged and extensive conversation on Facebook than I've ever had with anything before, um, which is fascinating in itself. Um, um, and um, well, so the question I asked was, was this, I asked, um, I said, uh, I'm seeing lots of people telling Israel what not to do which I completely understand and mostly agree with. And I'm not seeing hardly anybody tell Israel what to do. So what would you say? And if you were the boss of Israel, what would you do? Parentheses, it ain't easy. And there ensued a conversation. Um, so anyhow, that's that's the background of my world these last couple of weeks. Um, and um, I have periods of time where I'm able to work and focus and be a relatively normal human being, whatever that passes for these days, and periods of time where I'm just, you know, not not moving, not co not able to focus, uh, not coherent. Um, and strangely, very, very coherent within all that. So that's story number one. Story number two is that uh, Ken and I yesterday hosted Carol Sanford on our monthly Living Between Worlds call. Carol, uh, do people know her? Hand, fingers, mostly not, okay. So Carol's a, a masterful and highly regarded uh, business consultant, um, iconoclastic, um, um, has worked with you know folks ranging from Procter & Gamble to seventh generation, Numi T, uh, has written, uh, just came out with her seventh book. She's written a lot about regeneration and regenerative business. Um, and um, has a very different approach than most, um, um, very set in her ways about it. Uh, the new book, which is called No More Gold Stars, um, Regenerating, Regenerating the Capacity to Think for Ourselves, uh, is both a screed against incentives and rewards and goals and all the usual tricks of management um, and a... Um, and, and um, you know, a kind of nurturing love poem for how do we redevelop the capacity to think for ourselves. Um, she's so committed to that that she didn't want to do questions and answers in the call because she didn't want the whole framework of we have questions and she has answers. 
She wanted to nurture a kind of conversation which the, in which the answers emerged. It was very rich. The breakouts were unusually rich. Um, um, uh, notable on the book is that she's got two forwards to the book. Usually folks have one, if any. And the forwards are from Tom Peters, who says this turned him up on it, turned him on his head. Uh, and Tyson Yuna Caporta, author of Sand Talk. So uh, who sort of said it turned him on his head? So like two guys from really different worlds. Um, I thought that was a fascinating move. Anyhow, uh, it was um, it was rich and full of wonder and for me, very provocative in terms of how I work with clients. Um, and um, um, one of the things that Carol said is that she tries to never do the same thing twice. So if she's going to give a speech on a topic she's given it before, she does not pull out the deck and tweak it uh, for the new situation. She starts from scratch again, or so she says, uh, because she wants to freshen it in the moment of each thing. Um, and that was a challenge to all of us. Uh, Fernando Flores, I've been, as you know, I've been studying with a lot, says he's never more than 60% prepared for anything that he does. Uh, Carol sounds like she's, you know, maybe le less than that. So the, um, you know, the provocation of how much to be prepared, how much to have planned, how much to have designed is a really interesting one. Um, in my coaching work, I noticed that lots of other coaches make offers that say, I've got this, I've got this, you know, 12 week program that's going to take you through these 12 steps, or I'm going to deliver you these three results or something defined and prescriptive and predicted. And I find in my coaching work for, you know, for better or for worse from marketing perspective, I resist doing that. Uh, and I'm inviting people into a conversation that will move something, uh, but not through a prescribed series of steps, not a sequence, uh, not, you know, um, not even a guarantee because it depends on what they do. The guarantee, I guess, is the provocation, you know, um, um. Anyhow, so a uh, um, lot that was just yesterday afternoon, lots still stirring from that. Um, I've been uh, gradually working my way through these seven books in reverse order. Uh, and we'll have the video posted you know, probably late this week or early next week. And I'll share the link on OGM once it's there. And Judith, uh, you were there. I was really glad to see your face. Uh, and uh, at, at some point, would love to hear how that was for you. Well, that, that, that does not need to be now. So thank you. I, I was there it. too. You oh, I didn't see you, Stacy. Good, cool. Well, same, same to you. <laughs> to hear what your thoughts are. Also, we had I don't know. We had probably fifty people, and I couldn't see everybody on the screen. So, thank you. I'll go. Um, I always do enjoy the silence. So thank you, Jerry, for holding space. And, and thank you, Stacy, for wondering if, um, if we wanted to shift. Um, uh, I have a thing that I, is not the thing that I want to check in on. Um, and, but I'm going to anyway, because it's the thing that's kind of looming in my head. Um, this weekend is the 40th anniversary or 40th, uh, 40th alumni uh, reunion for my university, um, which is just mind blowing <laughs> that, uh, that we're all um, old enough to have a 40th uh, reunion. Um, uh, I'm actually still on leave. I took two years of university and went on leave to um, earn enough money to uh, go to Europe with a friend, which of that time in my life, the, the Europe trip is 
almost as important as my couple of years in university, but um, so I'm still on leave. I haven't finished my third and fourth year and I, I probably won't, but um, so there's a little bit of a, a trick thing where um, I'm not actually really invited to the alumni re re reunion. So I'm going uh, a classmate who I knew, but you know, didn't, haven't been in touch with for 40 years. Um, uh, pinged me and said, hey, Pete, you know, um, did you want to come to the reunion? And, and so we arranged it so that uh, she's not bringing her husband, so I get to be her plus one. Um, and it's all weird. Uh, it's actually starting today, today, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And I had kind of, I've, I've, I've been trepidatious the whole time. It's like, I don't want to think about it for lots of reasons. I'm a little bit shy in person. I'm going to be wearing a mask the whole time, even during dinner, which, <laughs> um, which I'm always cheered by my wife, Joanne, because she's like, whatever, I'm not embarrassed by it. I'm just going to wear my mask. Um, I, I uh, had the opportunity to drive a couple hours to a, kind of an in-person event with a bunch of people I never knew, but it was a super cool thing. Um, and I was wearing a mask the whole time. I was self-conscious the whole time. Um, uh, and I get self-conscious in weird ways because, you know, I, I, I don't want other people to feel bad. Like, oh, I wonder if I should be wearing a mask in front of that guy. Um, why is that guy like mucking up our pictures with a mask? Why, you know, and then I feel bad because other people might feel bad because, you know, it's like this whole thing. Plus, uh, the alumni weekend is not cheap and includes a very nice dinner, um, which I'm going to probably kind of like hover around and <laughs> pretend that I'm there, but not actually eat anything. And the whole thing is weird. So I've kind of been ignoring it. And I thought it was Sunday. It turns out that the, the main event is actually tomorrow. Um, so I get to drive up a couple hours to Pasadena and um, have a cool time with people I kind of know from 40 years ago. And um, and uh, then come back. It's a beautiful campus, uh, very cool university. I, I happen to go to Caltech, uh, which um, is just a wonderful gem of uh, uh, in the world uh, in a lots of different ways. Um, so it's exciting, scary, um, dis disappointing because I'm going to do the whole mask thing. Um, and so that's what I'm thinking of mostly this morning along with a bunch of other things I could be thinking about. Um, I've got thoughts about some of the things we started talking about. And because uh, that wouldn't be a check-in, that would be a conversation. Uh, I will save those for later. Maybe we'll talk about them, maybe we won't. Thanks. I'll do a check-in and Pete heard a piece of this conversation, I think yesterday or day before we had a, a, a nice conversation. And uh, it, this comes out of the Neo Books project, which is a series of calls on Mondays where we're trying to, to uh, author uh, books that kind of intersect and are reusable and are more interesting online than they are in the book form. Uh, and that has caused me to start thinking, <clears throat> uh, thinking like a Neo book. And that's kind of the thing I want to explore with you all uh, as, as my check-in, which is one of the conceits of neobooks is that the nuggets that make up the neobook, that roll up into a neobook, are actually composable and reusable in different settings. So if somebody had written a terrific description of how ChatGPT works, for example, um, then why not just use it in lots of different places where you need a description of ChatGPT if it fits, you know, if, and if it's written in some modular reusable format. Now, that breaks what I think is a taboo of book writing. And I think that one of the unwritten rules of books, correct me if you think I'm wrong later when we can talk, uh, is that books should contain entirely unique original content and that a book, an actual real book, has all words that were generated for that book only. And I'm trying to say, nah, not really. Um, that, that books could mix, match, and reuse, and you could have a series of different books. So for instance, Klaus is writing a book that combines 
uh, generative, regenerative agriculture, water and soil fertility with spiral dynamics and some theory you sprinkled in uh, at the end as like a, like a seasoning uh, uh, on it. And I can easily see that there could be another book that takes the same first half and changes it for a different, a, a different second half about applying a different framework uh, to solve the problems. And that would might, and that might turn into sort of a short series. I can also see that his bottom half about spiral dynamics could turn into its own little starter of a book about applied spiral dynamics. And that might ap ap appeal to spiral dynamics fans, et cetera, et cetera. And then other people might pick up different pieces or nuggets that he has created into their own threads or their reinterpretations reinter riffs on a theme. And that might turn into a web of book-like artifacts that actually the books are each points of point of view snapshots taken of a really interesting tapestry of nuggets that is interacting online. And so my meditation is, how do you write for reuse and for composability? Uh, and I've been trying to do that. So I'm, I'm trying to write a neo book about design from trust, which is a, an idea I had back in, I think, 2012 ish. Uh, that needs to exist, and it's really it's it's really fun. It's, I'm having a very good time. And uh, um, anyway, there's, there's there's more on that. I could go in lots of different directions from there. But that's that's kind of uh, when I step outside of the the global crises that are busy crashing around our ears all the time. That's the space I'm I'm uh, stepping into, and it's fun. It's been it's been really enjoyable. I'm a, a late joiner, but I'll uh, I'll leap in, uh, you know, all kinds of substantive stuff to uh, that have been spinning around, including Andreessen's uh, manifesto, which is like really, but uh, but I was thinking taking the lead from Pete. I was uh, it's personal stuff, and I'm probably most focused on what we've got. It's like kind of swirling things in the family where okay, one one piece of news, uh, uh, and hopefully, uh, uh, is that. Um, we will be moving back to the Bay Area. My wife's taking a job as the chief social impact officer at the School of Public Health in uh, this university in Berkeley. And um, so we'll be moving back to the Bay. Um, and meanwhile, my kids are kind of heading off in different directions. One of them's heading to Thailand to become, I don't know, it's not to the expense of time, at least as what I think of as the body man for a monk. So he's going to be traveling to Sri Lanka and then India and is considering joining a monastery. <clears throat> and the other kids rented a car and is driving across the uh, desert in uh, Kazakhstan. And it's like, I don't think he knows how to repair cars. So I'm not, I'm not really sure how well he thought this one through. So anyway, yeah, everybody's, everybody's in flow and motion, which I think is good, but it's a little disconcerting.
think I'd like a chicken. So I don't know if it's much to add, except for several years, actually maybe when OGM started, I really got into trying to understand how I, what my primary first order learnings were about how the world works, just growing up as I did. So I called it like you know, unlearning. So it's been um <laughs> I'm just reading today's Plex. There's a note in there about Ken has a piece and he's talking about all these little things come up in your mind when you have criticisms. You know, you should watch out for them. So I guess I would say I'm pretty aware of that. And I wish I was able to say something, but I don't think I have anything to say since I'm still kind of at sea. I wanna, uh, Doug Carmichael's writings have been pretty helpful in a way because I like the questions Doug poses because they don't have a simple answer. But I just feel like I'm in a years ago when I was studying thermodynamics, I got to a point where I was a problem I, I couldn't it basically took me five years to come to it to actually understand what I was trying to figure out. And I feel like I'm in kind of a weird space like that. Like I know there's some connections here. I have no idea what they are. I know I'm gonna have them. But I guess I'm not having them now. <laughs> so I feel like I'm in a very um, somewhat confused, but I don't know. I don't know what the word is. I just don't know what the word. I wish I had, I wish I could make more sense out of things. But I think the truth is I can't right now.
so maybe it's checkout time. I'm reluctant to give up on the community sense that's here. So I'll go, um, yeah, being a federal government employee and stuff and with all the craziness and stuff, the first thing that 
always gets canceled as any training and stuff. So there was a supposed to be, or there was a big conference on uh, on disability things in in uh, here in um, DC area, and I don't. I mean, all I be. I mean, the conference providers. I mean, they got they got the money and stuff, but all the exhibitors that pay put the money in to come to DC and then we were probably probably 80 75 80 percent of the attendees were probably government employees uh, um, I don't know if everybody had was in the position to have to cancel and I guess other big companies do that too if there's any kind of whenever there's any kind of issue the first thing they do is cancel training it seems like so a little disappointed there. Uh, just uh, this uh, continued roller coaster, or as I was joking with Doug Breitbart, it's more like a high speed elevator. Just we'll work to make the elevator car a padded, padded at least. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, Charlie Brown syndrome, bunch of projects and like just a step or two away and so that's kind of where I'm at today Okay, I'd like to, this is a kind of a meta comment, but I feel like right now we're in a kind of state where we're trying to give everybody time. We're going to be quiet until everybody checks in. And I know I took a very long time just to decide if I was going to. But I feel like there's no time bound here except for 1130, you know, the hour and a half. And so if people do not want to check in, there's no way to say I'm going to pass because I do not want to check in. And so um, something that Doug Carmichael mentioned, it's like, so in a way, it's a little bit like a, a computer race condition. Uh, what's going to be stuck? Because there's no way to move forward. It doesn't feel like there's a way. There's a 
Well, there's a clear way to be stuck. So maybe that's what it feels like to me. This came up a little bit in the chat, Bill. And I said, we don't really have a pass protocol. And Stacy just said, you can pass, or actually Gil just said, you can pass in the, in the chat or you can step in and pass. And I am consciously waiting for just about everybody to check in. And, and since this isn't like friends meeting, Quaker meeting, which lasts an hour, so at the hour you stand up, uh, we don't have a, 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 an elegant way to know when we're done or when we transition, which is intriguing. Yes, it's a race condition. Reminds me of waiting for Godot.
Well, we're supposed to be ourselves. Uh, anybody who is writing in chat is not listening to the silence. Is that important for other people to listen to the silence? Well, the illusion is that we're in the silence together, but we're not. Julian, you're muted. I wanted to break the silence by bringing up one of my favorite movies, which is Peaceful Warrior, roughly based on the life of Dan Millman. And Nick Nolte has a line in the movie, which is, there is never nothing going on. So there's pretty much nothing going on in the Zoom chat, except I hear occasional taps of somebody put something on a desk or something. But outside this screen that I'm looking at, there's plenty of noise. There's the neighbors getting a new roof. There are planes flying into San Francisco airport. There's uh, the sound of the space heater. There's there's no no silence, so it's like again. There's nothing. There's never nothing going on. Well, we've lost Doug B, who, as far as I can tell, was the only person who hadn't jumped into the conversation. And rather than step in, he stepped out, I think, unless he accidentally uh, pressed the eject button. Um, so with that, I declare our silent meeting portion over, and we can head back in uh, to any of the things that any of us raised, many of which were like really like super interesting and like places to go. Stacey, please. One thing? Yeah, can I just add, Doug put in the chat that he has to go, but would like to leave a question for all. What is the single most important thing that could be most valuable and generative in service to all? His answer is coherence, connection, and resonance between us in service to responding to what is needed emergency, emergently, moment to moment. What say you all? So that's the question he left us with. And ironically, perhaps in the context of this call, I completely missed that that had happened. <laughs> so I thought he had just bailed. Um, yeah. Stacy, thank you very much for pointing that out to me.
Um, and a thing I would love to do is debrief with all of you about the process of this call. Like for whom, I, Doug, it felt like it was very, it felt like you were being, the way you expressed yourself during the call, I heard that you felt you were being disrespected by people who were chatting during the call. Is that correct? Uh, no, uh, I didn't feel like disrespected as that it was aimed at me. Uh, I never had any thought like that. I just thought that um, the silence was somewhat hypocritical. So that it was disrespectful, but not disrespect that you were not the target of any disrespect, but it was disrespectful of us using the chat uh, to the silence. Uh, Gil then. Well, that would be a conclusion about what was going on. I had no conclusion about what was going on, except that it seemed to me. Uh, to me, uh, a waste of time after a, a while. Uh, Gil then, Pete? You're muted, Gil. Um, <clears throat> I, found, <clears throat> I found this to be a fascinating and uncomfortable experiment. And I'm glad we did it. <clears throat> um, Disrespectful, Jerry, is a judgment about something. And the observation, I, I think I think it'd be interesting to separate our observations from our judgments, if we can, not easy. Um, I have a couple of observations. One is that uh, I got twitchy and my intention was to ignore the chat. But I periodically would glance at the chat and I sometimes wrote in the chat and found it very difficult to not do that. Uh, so, Doug, to your point, thank you. Um, um, I find that it's challenging enough to be still and silent by myself. Um, and it's um, and it's maybe easier to do it with a group of people all facing in the same direction, like in a Zendo, in a shared practice, and looking at something or nothing all together. And it's very different to be sitting looking at each other and doing that. Um, so it's a really novel exploration. And I find myself wondering if, if, if we went to an hour meeting, if we had, if, oh, well, here, it's not, it's not like an app, here we are. I, I was just imagining a business context, going to an hour meeting and having everybody talking for an hour and then the meeting concluding or being in a meeting where nobody speaks for most of the time. And in the last few minutes, some people speak and the meeting concludes. Is that okay? Which is better? I don't know which is better. I don't know which produces more whatever clarity, unanimity, uh, common direction. Stacy asked in the chat about a goal. There's, there, are, there can there be can there be gatherings of people without a goal? Um, and I found myself wondering if all of the thoughts periodically coursing through my quiet mind were similar to the thoughts that are coursing through your quiet minds, which of course is the question of what's thinking anyway. Um, Fernando's fond of saying that, you know, so, somebody was saying something once about, well, I think this and this about that. And he said, well, you're not thinking. Thinking is something that's happening to you. So I was thinking about thinking happening to us while we're sitting here quietly. Pete. Uh, thanks, Gil. I wanted to skip over um, uh, re reflecting on the experience, but um, I, I guess I shouldn't. Um, I, I wanted to jump into something that came up uh, in the conversation uh, that I thought would be more more productive. But um, thanks, thanks all for participating in that. What turned out to be an experiment, I guess, uh, despite Jerry's protestations. Um, uh, Jerry, I really, really, really appreciate you holding the space for that. Thank you. Um, for context. And I'll, I'll get to the fact that I was one of the loud people in chat, but for context, um, that was in some ways the most, you know, one of the most more productive OGM calls I've had um, 
uh, and and honestly, the I, I goof off uh, in a typical OGM call because it helps me pay attention. I it, it's a weird thing, but um, the the easiest way for me to pay attention in chemistry class uh, of of one of the things I think I've told this story before, so I apologize if you've heard it before. But the easiest way for me to pay attention in chemistry class was sitting right uh, right in front of the teacher so he could see absolutely everything I was doing and I was doodling the heck out of it <laughs> and very technical doodling um, like right trying to write backwards in cursive trying to write vertically in cursive uh, so that if you turn the page you could see it you know like kind of the hardest doodling things my mind could do and that keeps everything in my head so that I could actually listen to him. So I, I, I cherished that teacher. Um, I don't know if he knew what I was doing, trying to accommodate, you know, whatever kind of ADHD that is. Um, I've never been diagnosed and, and I don't think the diagnoses are, I, a lot of our scales are kind of weird. They, they measure something, some of the right stuff and some of the wrong stuff. Um, anyway, I don't know if he knew what I was doing or the other thing was I always got A's anyway. So it's like, okay, I don't, <laughs> I can tell, you know, I, I can keep track of him. He's not being disruptive to the class. He's going to get an A, whatever. I'm not going to worry about it. So, so during an OGM call, I have to, to spin a lot of dials, uh, search a lot of stuff just to be able to pay attention to people talking. Um, anyway, sorry to get off on a tangent a little bit. The the thing I wanted to say for context, um, I could have had a, a lot more silence. I understand I felt uncomfortable a little bit too, but um, we didn't even get close to my tolerance for the amount of silence that we could have had together looking at each other. And the more we did it, the more I enjoyed it. I had more fun doing more silence. So I never got to the point where it's like, uh, you know, I'm freaking out and have to say something. Not even close. Um, uh, and I'm not saying that's a good thing or a bad thing. And I understand, I, and I, I have a lot of empathy for people who don't work the same way. I, so one of the lessons I think is that neurologies are different and the expectation that you have that we're doing something wrong is not necessarily the, the it's not necessarily consonant with everybody else's neurology. Um, for me, we were doing the right thing and we could have done more of it, a lot more of it. And I would have been happier if we had done more of it. Not saying that's a good thing or a bad thing. It's just, you know, for context. Um, uh, I, I took a couple notes. Let me make sure I hit all the high points. Um, the One of the things that I wanted to say that I didn't say because I didn't want to break the silence, um, even in chat, um, uh, I, at some point I'm freaking out. I'm like, okay, everybody's uncomfortable. I'm starting to get uncomfortable because other people are uncomfortable, not because I'm uncomfortable, but um, I'm starting to freak out a little bit. Okay. She's gone. He's gone. You know, that person's gone. Uh, you know, are we just hold, held up on one, you know, what's the deadlock, right? What's the race condition here? Um, and, and then I remembered, I relaxed. I went like, Jerry is a consummate facilitator. Jerry, I, I don't, I'm not going to think about who's the holdout yet. I ended up figuring it out later, but I'm like, I can relax because Jerry's got this. Jerry's a facilitator. No matter my discomfort level is kind of mounting and because other people's discomfort level is mounting. So I kind of wanted to say that in the moment and I didn't because I didn't want to say it in the moment, but so I trusted Jerry and that, that made me, my blood pressure go back down. Um, it's interesting to say that there's uh, an, uh, I, Stacey, I like your question. Did we achieve our goal? Was there a goal? Should we have had a goal? Um, I love having goals. Um, for me, there was an emergent goal of being in silence together that was really beautiful and wonderful. And that was, um, and, and we got partway there. We could have gone further and gotten more of, of the goal that was emergent for me. Um, again, not that that's a good thing or a bad thing. It's, you know, what I felt. Um, I, I appreciate Doug's comment that the people in chat are cheating the, the silence. <laughs> um, and I, I, I talked a little bit about using chat as a, as a side channel or a, a fork conversation or things like that. I could talk on and on about whether or not 
you know, I want one conversation or multiple conversations or whether or not chat is a distraction. I'm very conscious and very, very self-conscious about chat. Um, uh, so right away when Doug said, uh, Doug C had said what he said, you know, people in chat are, are essentially cheating the system is the way I heard it. I don't think Doug was that judgmental either. Um, uh, like I, I disagree because I, I, when I was attending to chat, obviously I wasn't listening to the silence very well, but a lot of times I would stop chat and listen to the silence and it was, the silence was louder and more effective, um, uh, than, than talking usually is for me in an OGM call. I don't know if that makes sense. Um, the thing I wanted to, to respond to, um, to, to flip the channel a little bit. Um, <clears throat> I, 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 have a, I have a very, very, very weak, poor answer to, uh, to Gil's uh, challenge question, which is, okay, I hear a lot of people saying, uh, what should Israel, you know, what should Israel stop doing? Um, and nobody says, very few people say what Israel should do. I have an answer for that. And where I sit, it's easy. I, I want to acknowledge very deeply that it's very easy for me to say something or, you know, think that, oh, I've thought about this problem and I have the answer and, you know, nobody else has thought, of, you know, nobody over there has thought about it. I don't know why they just don't take my advice. That's not what I'm trying to convey at all. But, um, but I think I know the answer, a, 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 a way to express the answer. And I don't know how you would do it, but I think Israel should practice radical compassion. And that's the only way that bootstraps out of this whole thing. Um, it's, and I understand, I, if I were in Israel's shoes, it, you know, uh, Israel is, it's kind of weird to say that because Israel is a whole complex of, uh, you know, a, a political leadership that is in the driver's seat and not driving very well and causing a lot of problems. And then there's a whole societal thing where I, it's a very complex and rich society. You know, it's not like it's one thing that's going, oh, well, I'm gonna beat people up instead of practicing radical compassion. But if, if I could say, you know, if I could whisper in somebody's ear um, and say, you know, I, I found a, a, a really good, I think it was a tweet um, by a guy who's Jewish and, and said, you know, so here's the deal. This is a bad situation in lots of ways. And there's lots of historically bad reasons. Um, you know, it, it would have been nice if, you know, back in the day, um, the, the people who decided to gift the Israel is uh, the land that Israel sits on. It would have been nice if, um, you know, the, the British or the Americans or somebody Maybe they should have cited that um, uh, in the middle of Europe somewhere, or maybe they should have cited it somewhere in North America where there wasn't a contentious, um, you know, uh, claim over the land. Um, and, and the reason they didn't do that was kind of through a weakness, uh, uh, an inability or an insensitivity in to a lot of other things that were going on. I, I don't mean to dissect the whole thing, but, you know, there's, there's a lot of issues there and, everybody who's on the ground there is in a really difficult situation. And, and you know, I, I feel for that. And it's going to take generations to unwind. And I come back to, you could keep fighting a war, or you can say, I'm just going to be, I'm going to do the opposite of that. And the opposite of that is actually love thy brother, not, you know, not kill your brother. So easy, easy for me to say in my seat. Um, I have a, another odd thing to kind of go along with that. Um, uh, one of the folks that we know a little bit uh, in OJM, I know him a lot better from other communities. Uh, he's, he and I are, are working at Stitching Communities together. Michael Lennon, um, you've probably, some of you have seen him on calls. Um, he and I got into kind of a deep discussion about it. And um, to Judy's question, you know, do when you're talking with your friends, do you talk geopolitical, like deep stuff, or do you just talk, you know, kind of easy, easy uh, domestic stuff? Um, I do some of both. And with my, my friends, we end up in pretty deep conversations. Um, uh, um, Michael and I got to talking about music kind of following on the OGM music hall. Um, and then he said something that really, Pete, something that really touched me was um, a YouTube video. Um, there's an organization in Israel that gets people together in kind of radical connectivity 
um, instead of something like silence, like we practiced, um, they, uh, they do song. Um, so there's a great uh, um, video of a song called One World, uh, and they, they have a, a group of people. Uh, there are some parts, it's in Haifa, I think, there are some parts of that, that part of the world where your neighbors are not just uh, um, Jews or not just Arabs or not just Muslims, but you get all three at once. And that's kind of like, oh, yeah, I'm friends with, you know, next door's somebody different than me. And they're not different from me because we're all neighbors. We're all the same, you know. So this song is uh, taught to a large group of people in a hall or something like that over the course of an hour. And then they sing the whole thing and they sing the whole thing in, in um, Hebrew and English and Arabic. Um, and I think I'm butchering the Arabic part of that. But anyway, and, you know, he said, I, I want to communicate um, uh, I want to communicate why this touched me and and what this situation reminds me of is he had some personal interactions kind of with the edge of the uh, the Iraqi war after 9/11 which he thought was just a, a travesty of, of justice and and things like that you know we ended up fighting the wrong war with the wrong people killing a bunch of people who didn't need to be killed um, and and this particular situation reminded him of that I so, he, you know, he kind of wrote up a little blurb. I was going to put it in Plex, and then, uh, and then an hour or two later, he said, "Pete, I've got a, a Jewish friend who's got a hard stop on any anything to do with. He just doesn't want to see any of it in the media. Um, uh, I just don't want to. He just doesn't want to think about it, which is fair. And and he said, Pete, I don't know what you should do with the Plex. I don't know if if you should run this or not run this. Um, I ended up thinking, wanting to run it. Uh, that that is it, J Jerry." Um, uh, I said, you know, I, I need to talk to more people. I, uh, edit my editorial processes, it ends up, uh, Plex ends up being a lot done uh, late at night uh, at the end of the day and past everybody's bedtime kind of. So, uh, so maybe, we'll, maybe I'll run it next, uh, uh, next issue after some, some talking amongst us. So um, uh, thanks. It's a tough situation. Um, and and it's it's a, a tough enough situation that I even, I even wonder. So as as I, the reason I mentioned Plex, I wonder if I've been, I can even talk about it, you know, in in plenary. And then it's like, so if we're not talking about it in plenary, then that's really bad, right? And that's I don't know what that means, but Gil, maybe you should go. Judith, I Gil? could jump ahead of you for just a moment. Would that be okay, Judith? Yeah, just very briefly, Pete. Um, um, I'm very moved by what you said about radical compassion and um, and felt it would have been much more powerful if you just had stopped there and surrendered to the silence. Because um, my experience was that you filled it with lots of chatter after that, out of whatever for you. And the experience for me was that it took me into Oh well, yeah. There's the history, but I have a different interpretation of that history, and you got this fact wrong. And I'm just like, then I'm just like, I'm into into the briar patch. Uh, whereas if you say radical compassion and stop there, I'm left with like, huh? What is that? How would that? What would that be? What would happen? It just like takes me to a very different kind of mind. Uh, and that's I think the brilliance of that suggestion is that this whole thing is mired in everything that's said before on all sides. Uh, and everybody's interpretations of everybody's interpretations of everybody's interpretations of what's been said before. And there is no fucking way out of that. Um, and you dropped, you know, you dropped a pebble in the pond of something very different and wanted to see the ripples. So Thank you, Bill. Silence. Thank you for what you said. And Gil, thank you for that. That's really useful and clarifying. And Judy, thank you for letting the interruption happen. Uh, take your time jumping in and you are muted right now. I had to get to the unmute button. Um, I have a number of thoughts. And first of all, I like the experiment of silence. Um, and then I was intrigued by where that led me. 
because it wasn't mental silence for me. And I want to preface that by saying that part of what I most love about a typical OGM call is that it prompts me to learn more about whatever the topic is that has come up. What, what I'm learning it through the chat because people who've done more than me are contributing links that I can then go to to learn about things. But what I find most stimulating and valuable about OGM is the invitation to continue learning about things you don't know about or wish you did know about and the opportunity to take counsel from people who have dealt with them in more depth that would be essentially a guide. So I view the fellow OGM participants as my personal guides <laughs> in terms of a, a lot of different areas of study that isn't just study, but it's study that leads to action and leads to an opportunity to either do something about it in my community or gather a group of people to see what the local community thinks or whatever that might be. But it's this very subtle transition from intellectual concept to definition, to potential action, to taking action. That to me is what this community represents. And there's a richness in the people who are here because these are people I would never have known. And I feel comfortable sending them an email saying, can you tell me more about X <laughs> or what's happening in your area? So I wanna acknowledge that as the main reason that I really love OGM is the complexity of viewpoints and wisdom of all of the people in the room. Having said that, it was fascinating to see where my mind went in that much silence. I live alone, so I have the opportunity of personal silence whenever I want. All I have to do is turn off something that's streaming or whatever. And so I'm not so much interested in going to a silent event <laughs> as I am experiencing the gentle stimulation of what OGM has provided to me. Makes great sense, Judy. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Um, yeah, I, I want to clarify that I'm really comfortable in the silence. When I disturbed it or interrupted it or even thought about whether or not it had gone past its usefulness, it was because I so respect and value the opinions of the people in this group that I kind of wanted time to go into the topic that Pete brought up later. I didn't want to see that time wasted if the purpose of the silence had been accomplished. I also come from a place that I think it's really important that as individuals and as groups, we question why we do things. So Typically, I try to keep my answers, my, my contributions short. There were many times in the silence where I would have, where I felt like I would have liked to interject just a question to think about. And I'm curious if that would have thrown Pete off or if that would have been, been as comfortable. I didn't feel, I didn't feel like I wanted to do that from my own personal insecurities and reasons. And, you know, I, just to give you a little bit of background, when I'm, when I'm in a Facebook group and I just ask a question in some places, I am constantly called a Karen. I've been told people like me should be exterminated. I mean, I get battered all the time. Luckily, it's not like that here, but for me, I keep hearing, I mean, and I loved, you know, Gil, I loved um, the speaker yesterday. And the reason that I was thinking about college today is because I recognized that I'm being drawn to people that I've never read or heard about. But I recognize that I have probably, through teachers I've had or people I've spoken to, been impacted by them, whether I've realized it or not because we're all a product of everybody and everything we've ever touched. 
So not to go on a not to go on a ramble, but anyway, back to today. There were times that I felt like I wanted to channel Maxine Waters and reclaim my time and just throw out, you know, take 10 seconds to just throw something out. And then we could be silent to Gil's point to have, you know, that inter that interplay between words and silence. That's what I'm most interested in. So thank you. So I just want to add, Jerry, if we want to do this again, which I thought was really interesting and has value, I still think that, you know, this group's been around for a long time. I have been sort of a haphazard, idiosyncratic participant. But nonetheless, there is perhaps even an unspoken primary task that you gather people together for. Sometimes it's more explicit. Right. Here's a headline from the New York Times. Let's talk about this. Right. OK, so that's expected to be a conversation around. Right. So if we wanted to really have this kind of open, silent check in, I still think it really needs to be bounded in a way so that when we come here, we have some expectation about how the time what's going to happen in the time allotted. You know, like when I was uh, an active Zen student, right? You go to the Zen door and it's, you know, whatever. It's three hours and what are you doing? Well, we're sitting, right? Then they're going to ring the bell. We're all going to chant and go you know, go to work or whatever. So, but it's, you know, it's, it's bound. It's got boundaries and there's, you know, kind of like, you know what you're there to do. So I think that might help. I mean, you're really, I mean, you know, as a facilitator, you can sort of, manage that but i mean my little uncomfortable was i felt like okay we're just gonna let this expand you know until it bumps into the walls and then we're, we're done uh like uh the truman show um when you sail out and bump into the edge of the set uh thank you for that bill uh, several things um and I'm forgetting all of them right now. They're all fleeing from my mind as I'm focusing my mind on answering the question. So I love our quick conversations. I am a monster fan of it. And I love racing with Pete to, to do the background and find the links for stuff and pour them into the chat. <clears throat> and I love the overwhelm of uh, being able to sort of handle the conversation and this and that. And it is continuous partial attention as Linda Stone coined years ago, but I think that form of multitasking is really actually sort of a, a superpower and a fun thing. And I don't feel overwhelmed by it, but I know that it overwhelms some people. The call we had today was roughly, but not entirely the opposite. And was also the product of us having built some sense of community among ourselves. Like, like the thing I used, once I started falling in love with Quaker meeting and in, in, at Wilton monthly meeting in Connecticut, before I moved into New York, I would arrive early intentionally to the meeting, uh, like around when the greeter was getting there. I would go take a seat across from the doors where people came in, and I would just start watching everybody I loved come in and take a seat. And I found it really moving. I was moved just by the act of recognizing and welcoming quietly in my heart the people that I was like really growing fond of. And that was delightful to me. And and Doug C., you're completely correct that chatting is not full attention and full mindfulness to the silence. But, but whether to chat or not chat, what the protocol is when we end, do we have an ending? Well, we always have an ending at, at 90 minutes. We know, we know that we know that we're not going to run a lot past 90 minutes and we're about to bump into that, that edge of the set. Um, but all of these things are just levers. These are all just variables we can play with. And I'm happy to play with them in any arrangement we like. We, we, what we could do on check-in calls is say, we're going to do check-in protocol for the first 45 minutes, and then we're going to switch. And at the 45-minute timer, we're going to bounce into conversation, and whoever didn't get to check in didn't get to check in. Although part of the goal of the check-in call, as we currently have a set, is that everybody gets the check-in. But that would that would create a nice demark, and I'm I'm happy to to sort of uh, do that. Um, and and it there's this there's this logical rational part of the brain that's like gosh 
when as Judy just expressed so nicely, when we're together, we have these like zoomy great conversations and we learn a bunch and we share stuff that I, I'd never heard about, you know, a bunch of stuff that's in, in the chat today. <clears throat> and if is it a waste to not be doing that? Is silence a waste? And actually it's like, well, gosh, no, silence is like this treasure. And trying to balance those things is really interesting, which is kind of why I'm sort of comfortable with our balance right now of alternating weeks, where one week we go zoomy on something and we talk about narrative and storytelling and what role does it play. Uh, and then the next week we do this and we experiment with this format. So open to all suggestions, but that's kind of some of my, my thinking. On, these are all just variables. And we could, in fact, have silent silent meeting, you know, meeting for worship protocol and, and turn off. I could disable the chat. Um, and I could, I could also request that people not take notes by themselves during the call, which would be hard for me to do, really hard, because whenever somebody checks in and does something, I will also point out that the way we're checking in is not the Doug, Doug Carmichael protocol, where his question is, what is what is like really worth talking about here? That's, that's the question we should have been answering in the Doug protocol, which is not what we're doing either. So these, again, these are all just variables. Julian. I liked uh, what you said about how the Quaker meeting protocol is, you know, and following up for what Phil said, that seems like a good way to do it. Uh, the other thing I was wondering is if uh, people were notified quite a few days ahead of time, and then you get a chance to think about what you're going to do during that silence. Um, I think that may conflict with the idea of trying to be in the moment. But uh, yeah, I, I wonder what would happen if, if you get to think about it ahead of time. And also, the, the point about turning off the chat, that seems to me essential if you're trying to go for silence, because Doug is absolutely right. So. Um, and I just notice how twitchy I get, not just at the thought of turning off the chat, which I can live with, but telling me not to take notes. And Jerry, I imagine that's going to be like really hard for you, because that's what you've been doing for decades. Well, and in Quaker meeting, you can see everybody and there's no, no, nobody's got a notepad and pen out and you're fully present. And uh, we had a fireplace that would be like lit. Somebody would show up early and light the fireplace whenever it was like fall through early, through early spring. And that was just beautiful. And there was a window out to the grounds and you were just immersed in the experience of being in, in a beautiful space. So I loved that as well. Um, Ken is not with us today, uh, he is, I think, on um, travels to Italy. Is that right? Is that his his timing right now? Which be his flight got canceled last night. And I oh don't know crap! This morning, I, he actually just sent a text. So I will tell you in a second. Oh shoot! Got, but I have a poem to read to us. So they rerouted him. So uh, they forfeited night in Milan, but off they go, leaving okay. leaving in an hour. He said, um, half hour ago. Awesome! Thank you. Thanks, thanks for the update. Love that. But he's getting, he's getting a night in Zurich instead of Milan, which is non-terrible. Non-terrible, exactly. That's great. Um, so I'm going to read a poem uh, by uh, Derek Walcott called Love After Love. Ooh. And I'll just paste it in the chat so nobody needs to look it up. <clears throat> and it goes like this. Love After Love. The time will come when, with elation, you will greet yourself arriving at your own door in your own mirror and each will smile at the other's welcome and say, sit here, eat. You will love again the stranger who was yourself. Give wine, give bread, give back your heart to itself, to the stranger who has loved you all your life, whom you ignored for another, who knows you by heart. Take down the love letters from the bookshelf, the photographs, the desperate notes. Peel your own image from the mirror. Sit, feast on your life. And I highly recommend watching David White recite this poem by heart, which mm -hmm. is available on YouTube and in your grocer's freezer. <laughs> he is a master of reciting poetry and he repeats lines in a way I don't know how to do that lets them sink in beautifully 
Um, it's wonderful. Um, thank you all. I think we're I think we're complete for today. And um, all thoughts and comments welcome in the channel, in the call, ping me, zoom me, whatever. Thank you. Thanks all. Thank you, everybody.